Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, thank you all so much uh, for coming today. My name is Ellie. I'm on the product team at Cohere. Um, I'm here today with Scott. Uh, Scott, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Yep. Hey, folks. I'm Scott. I'm a product manager at Surge. Really excited to have you all here and to dive into more about uh, fine-tuning language models. I'll pass it back to Ellie. Awesome. Uh, yeah, during the call today, we'd appreciate if you could mute yourselves uh, until the Q&A portion uh, at the end of, of the workshop, uh, and then feel free to unmute and ask questions. Uh, while Scott and I um, are, are um, walking through our respective products today, feel free to post questions in the chat uh, throughout, and we'll answer those at the end as well. Uh, and at the end of the webinar today, you'll all receive an email uh, with a link to the data set that we'll be using for this example. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to, to speak with you all today about leveraging both Surge and Cohere to build a custom language model for your, your project, or your product. Uh, so for those who maybe aren't as familiar with language models on the call today, these are tools that can ultimately help you unlock new product or feature capabilities, uh, cut costs, uh, and ultimately be more customer centric, whether you're interested in better understanding the voice of your customer through a sentiment analysis tool, uh, summarizing content, generating copywriting material, the possibilities are really endless and, and very exciting. And so Cohere offers baseline language models you can use without any additional training, uh, but we do offer the ability to create a custom solution. So given a data set that reflects the type of behavior or the type of task uh, you'd like to elicit from the model, we can build a custom language model to excel at that task uh, and optimize performance before you go to production. But in order to build a custom language model, you need high quality data, which some developers might not have at the ready. So during the calls today, Scott will walk through how to kick off a project in the Surge platform to get a high quality data set. Uh, and then I'll take the mic and walk through how to leverage that Surge data set to build a custom language model that you can then ultimately productionize. Uh, anything you wanna add, Scott, before we get started? No, let's jump in. All right, so let me share my screen here and get started. So for those of you who just joined, uh, hey, good to see you. I'm Scott. I am a product manager at Surge AI. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today as we teach you a bit about fine-tuning language models for, for any use case. Uh, like Ellie mentioned, we encourage you to ask questions along the way either in the chat or save them for the end. And we'll try to get to uh, as many of them uh, as we can at the end of the session. So I wanna first kick this off by giving you a, a bit of context uh, on Surge AI and what we do. Then I'm gonna briefly explain why having high quality data is so important when it comes to training models. And then finally, we're gonna dive into the fine tuning process with a, a hands-on demonstration of building a custom training data set on the Surge platform. And then I'll pass it back to Ellie and she'll show you how to actually use that data set to fine tune a model on the Cohere platform. So for a little bit of context, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Surge AI, we are a data labeling platform and human workforce that builds custom high quality data sets for folks like you so that you can ship better models faster. So we provide the training data and then you can go train great models. We work with a ton of awesome companies that are deploying AI and ML in really novel ways. So folks like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, research labs at Stanford and NYU, and large language model companies like Anthropic, and of course, our good friends here at Cohere. So one of our core beliefs at Surge, and, and I know that Ellie and the folks at Cohere know this well and would agree, is that the quality of your training data is a huge factor 
in determining how well your model works in the real world. So in some ways you can actually think of your model as a child, right? And you can only teach this child through example. So if you give it a bunch of bad examples to learn from, you shouldn't really be surprised when it grows up and starts misbehaving. And the process of putting together a training data set is really just the process of selecting all the examples you want your child slash model to learn from. So it's critical that each of these examples is high quality and accurate. Otherwise, you are actually just simply teaching your model the wrong behavior. So we're going to jump into the fine tuning process here and, and make this tangible. So for today's webinar, let's say that we want to build a toxicity classifier for Twitter. So we want this model to look at tweets and determine if they are either toxic or not toxic. It's as simple as that. It's basically a binary decision with a confidence score associated with that decision. Now, if we can build a model that can do this accurately, we can, first of all, drastically speed up our content moderation decisions and, and workflow. But more importantly, we can actually make our platform a more enjoyable and civil place for all, which is obviously the end goal when building products like this. So the first thing that we need to do in this fine tuning process is we need to build a training data set that contains examples of toxic tweets and examples of non-toxic tweets. And then we're going to use that data set to teach the model what we think of as toxic and what we think of as not toxic so that it can go out in the real world and make accurate judgments on text that it's never seen before. So we need to make sure that this training data set is of adequate size and diversity and quality to show the model all different kinds of toxicity and all different kinds of non-toxicity. So I'm gonna peel back the curtain here a bit and show you the work that we would do behind the scenes to build a data set like this for customers like you. So let's go to the Surge platform. And I can see a list here of recent data labeling projects that I've run. And we're gonna start with a project to gather toxic tweets. So I can preview the task here. And now I'm, I'm actually seeing what the sergers, these, these are the humans on our platform, are going to see when they work on the task. So you, it's, it's actually quite simple, right? I'm just asking folks to go to Twitter, find some toxic tweets. I'm giving them a brief definition of how I'm thinking about toxicity. And they're gonna go out and find tweets that fit this criteria. They're gonna submit uh, the URL and the raw text of the tweet and we're gonna start building our data set. So I'm doing two key things here to make this data collection project successful. First, I'm providing guidance to the sergers. Again, those are the folks on our platform who are actually gonna do this work of going and finding these tweets. I'm providing guidance to them on how they should think about toxicity for this project. So it's actually quite simple. I'm just using a simple sentence here to say, hey, go find toxicity that you think people would generally agree is toxic. Now that's pretty open-ended, but for other customers, like you may have 25 pages of guidelines with strict criteria for your specific platform on how you wanna to define toxicity. So maybe you have um, strict criteria for what constitutes sexism on your platform or what constitutes racism on your platform. That's okay too. Either is fine. As long as you have a clear idea of what you want the model to behave, how you want the model to behave, then we can work with you to craft the guidance so the sergers can find the correct types of content to build this data set. So that's the first thing I'm doing to set myself up for success. The second thing I'm doing is I'm going to assign a particular team of sergers to this project so that only they can work on it. So on the surge platform, we have teams of sergers with all different kinds of specialties. So some are coders who work on code generation AI projects. We also have a team of creative writers who work on generative AI. And in this case, we have a team of sergers who are deeply familiar with the nuances of online toxicity. So this is my toxicity team here. You can see I have a couple hundred people in it and all of them are vetted and very familiar with going out online and either finding or evaluating this type of toxicity. So in this case, it means that they're well-educated, they're going to be fluent English speakers, and they're going to understand the political jargon and other coded language used on Twitter uh, and other online platforms uh, to sometimes promote harmful content. So you could think of phrases like, let's go Brandon or FJB or acronyms like that, that 
you actually sort of need to be plugged into the cultural context here to understand what they mean. Um, they mean more than just a collection of letters or, um, or a phrase about, you know, someone named Brandon. So now that my project is ready to go, I can simply launch it and it gets automatically sent out to that team of sergers. They get a notification and they start working on it, going out to Twitter, finding these tweets and submitting them to us. And at the same time, I'm also going to create a project to gather non-toxic tweets, right? Because I need both classes of data here. So I have a project for toxic tweets. I'm going to do another project for non-toxic tweets. It looks very similar. And I'm, I'll show you in a minute that I'm, I'm actually going to collect three different types of non-toxic tweets to make my model perform even better. But I'll show you with, with examples a bit later. But I can go ahead and launch this project too. And when I do, I have both projects running. And I just need to wait a little bit of time for the data to come back. Um, it's going to get run through some automated quality controls we have on our end to make sure the quality is very high. And just a few moments later, voila, I have a finished data set of a thousand tweets that we can dive into and check out the results. So let's do that. By the way, this is the data set that we are going to send out to all of you after this webinar. So um, you'll have access to it. You can download it, do whatever you want with it, add to it, modify it as you wish. Um, I'll show a few examples here, but you'll get a link after the webinar to this data set and you can, you can do as you please with it. Um, so you can see here that I have a thousand tweets. This is all the raw data in a table format. I can scroll through and make sure it all looks good. I can also see the breakdown up at the top that I've gathered, you know, 50% of my data set is toxic tweets. And then the remaining 50% uh, is covered by these three categories of non-toxicity. And as I mentioned before, I didn't just gather generic non-toxic tweets. So I actually specifically gathered non-toxic tweets that use profanity and non-toxic tweets that use reclaim slurs. Now, this is a crucial step to ensure that our model doesn't start thinking that any instance of profanity or any instance of a slur means that a tweet or the text is toxic. And this is how we can quickly actually make our, our models behave in a really nicely nuanced way through the fine tuning process. And let's just look at a few examples uh, to drive this point home. So here's our first tweet here. Uh, the text of the tweet, and excuse my French, but the text of the tweet is, holy shit, I thought Doggo was just terrified, right? Now, some um, toxicity classifiers on the market today would actually get fooled by this because they would see this word shit and they'd think, oh, it must be toxic because that's a bad word. But to all of us on this call, <clears throat> it's really obvious that this is not toxic, right? This is actually um, a video of a dog playing goalie, playing hockey goalie um, and doing an amazing job. So I highly recommend that you watch this after. <clears throat> but we can all agree. We can all agree that this is not uh, a toxic text that we would want off our platform. So similarly, we have our second tweet here that says, "Update: I'm still that bitch." Right. So obviously, the word "bitch" can be used as a slur. Um, in this case, obviously, it's not being used as a slur. It's actually being used as a, a statement of confidence and positivity. And we want to make sure that this again is not flagged as toxicity. So we're specifically calling out to the model like, hey, when you see text like this, make sure you understand that it's not toxic. And so in that way, we're building a uh, data set that's powerful enough to cover these different nuances and use cases so that our model can actually go out into the real world and make accurate judgments on the way that people actually speak. So I can continue to scroll through and check out the different examples of, of tweets we have in here. Um, I'll let you guys do that after the webinar. Um, uh, but for the time being, I've looked at my data. I'm confident I have the classes that I need. Um, it's diverse, it's large enough, and it's ready to start the next phase of the fine tuning process. So now that I'm ready to move on, I can simply download my results as a, a CSV or JSON file up here in the top right. And with that, I would take that file to the Cohere platform and start fine tuning a model on this data set. So I'll pass it back to Ellie now, who's going to walk through 
the rest of this process of taking the data set, using the Cohere platform to actually fine tune their base model on this and having a, a model ready to deploy. So Ellie, uh, back to you. Sounds great. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can you see my screen all right? Yeah, we got you. Awesome. Uh, so as Scott uh, called out, uh, custom language models are really helpful tools for moving the needle on performance uh, for tasks that are incredibly niche. <clears throat> so for example, with the toxicity classification task that we have today, there isn't one standard definition for what defines toxic content. Um, many platforms uh, define toxicity in unique ways, depending on their user base or their product. So for example, a gaming platform, uh, an ed tech community for, for young kids, and a social media platform all likely have very distinct definitions of uh, what is toxic content. And this is where a, a custom model can be can be really helpful. So let's get started. Uh, as Scott, as Scott um, called out, what I've done behind the scenes here is I've downloaded that Surge data set um, as a CSV uh, from their website. And then I've gone ahead and mapped all of the labels into two distinct categories, toxic and not toxic, just for purposes of the example today. So instead of having uh, the additional labels like non-toxic with reclaimed speech, non-toxic with profanity, I just have have two buckets and I've turned this into a binary classification problem. So to create a custom language model with Cohere, um, it's actually really simple. All I need to do is specify the type of task uh, for this particular example. It's a classification task. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and upload that training set. Uh, you optionally can specify a, a validation set as well, which can be used to contextualize the performance of your fine tune uh, across different uh, different performance benchmarks. Um, or I can just upload the default file like I'm going to do today. And what Cohere will do behind the scenes is uh, extract a portion of those samples to be used for validation. I'll then go ahead and review my data, make sure that everything's formatted correctly. Um, I'll go ahead and name um, my model, call it toxicity classifier. And then I'll go ahead and start training. Um, so once we've kicked this off, it'll take about 10 minutes uh, to train. And while it's training, we'll start to see these performance uh, results trickle in here. Fortunately, we don't have to wait. Uh, right before this webinar, I kicked off a fine tune so I could show you the performance uh, improvements in real time. So let me go ahead and switch tabs here. So to get an idea of how the custom language model performs against a baseline uh, non-customized non offering, we can project uh, the embeddings of the samples into a two-dimensional vector plot or vector space um, in our playground. So at a high level, you can think of embeddings as a numerical vectorized representation uh, of the meaning of a word or phrase. And the distance between two points uh, in the plot represent how semantically similar they are. So the closer those two dots are in the plot, the more similar and vice versa. So to test our baseline model here, I've added a few toxic and non-toxic samples, which weren't found in our training data set. Uh, a good model for this task will have a very clear separation between samples that are toxic and samples that are not toxic as they are semantically very different. And so I've projected the embeddings for our baseline large model. Uh, you can see that there isn't a clear distinction between the samples that I would define as toxic and the samples I would define as not toxic. 
But when we project those embeddings for the fine tune model, we can see two distinct clusters, uh, which is actually really exciting. Uh, so we can see that non-toxic uh, samples are found in this grouping and toxic samples are found in the grouping to the right of the screen. So similar data points are now pushed even closer together uh, and further apart from the rest, which indicates that this model has adapted really well to the additional data uh, that it received during training, during training and is uh, more likely to perform uh, even better for this particular classification task. Now we can actually go ahead and test the model in real time in the playground with some examples. So here I've added a few samples of text that contain profanity, uh, but don't align with my working definition of what toxic content looks like. So these are all non-toxic samples that contain uh, some profanity. We can go ahead and specify that fine-tuned model here in the playground and classify the samples. And we see that all of these samples have the correct label of not toxic with an accompanying uh, confidence score. So all of these classifications are correct. From here as a developer, what I would likely do is evaluate this model with a few more examples, make sure I'm really happy with the result. And then I can consider productionizing um, this classifier. Let's say building a sample, building a system that automatically classifies a random sample of user content. Uh, and then when a sample is deemed toxic, I could then trigger a job to remove that sample um, from the platform. Great. So I will kick it back over to Scott to highlight uh, another example of how you can how you can leverage search um, and search and um, cohere to build a custom language model. Awesome. Thanks, Ellie. Um, that was that was great. I love seeing those embeddings too. It's always so satisfying. Um, so we want to do one more example in the few minutes we have left before we see if there are any questions from you folks. Uh, this was a toxicity classifier, the, the first model we fine-tuned. Now we want to fine-tune a uh, generative AI model. So in this case, we're going to use sort of one of the, the canonical examples here where what our model is going to take as an input is a essay for, or a subject or a keyword for an essay and then a tone of voice. And then it's going to output uh, a paragraph or a couple paragraphs of text based on uh, the combination of that tone of voice that we specified and the keywords. So we're going to do this sort of in an expedited fashion. Um, but we built another data set here. <clears throat> we built another data set here of 300 examples of snippets of text associated with um, with a keyword. So in this case, I have a paragraph on why you should eat breakfast before school and I'm asking for a persuasive tone, and then I'm having a surger either write or go out and find um, paragraphs that meet that meet that criteria. And I'm gonna do a hundred of these for each tone. So persuasive, friendly, and professional are my three tones. And I'm gonna build this data set in a similar fashion to how I built the, the uh, Twitter data set by having folks go out and find this text or, or create this text from hand um, and associate it with uh, the keyword and the tone of voice. And in that same way, we're going to use this training data set to show the cohere baseline model, like, hey, this is how I want you to behave given this keyword and a tone of voice. Here's a bunch of examples of what I want you to do. And now when I give you a new keyword, a new or, or uh, yeah, a new keyword and one of the tones of voice I've specified, um, you can go create brand new text. So you can imagine this has tons of use cases for for speeding up business workflows or creating interesting uh, fiction content um, runs a whole a whole gamut. Uh, once again, I kicked off a labeling job to get this done, got these results back quickly, and now I can download the results and pop back over to Cohere to fine tune this model. Uh, so going to go back to Ellie and she's going to show just the process of not only fine tuning it, but what it actually looks like in production uh, 
to, to ship this live. So Ellie, back to you. Awesome. I'll go ahead and share my screen again. So for this next job, we'll go through the same workflow uh, we did the first time around. Uh, but this time we'll specify a generative task. We'll go ahead and, and upload that data set um, that we downloaded from the Surge platform. And then once that model has finished training in the Cohere platform, you'll receive a specific model ID. And what you can then go ahead and do, click to copy that model ID. You can experiment with the model directly in the playground uh, as we did with that last toxicity classification example, or you can go right ahead and start to, to plug this into your specific project or application. Uh, so you can go ahead and call the generate endpoint uh, and where you specify the model, instead of pointing to one of the default out of the box cohere models, you'll go ahead and paste the ID um, of the, the custom model that you trained. And so for this example today, uh, I built a really simple, low fidelity uh, web app um, that calls the generate endpoint uh, specific to that model um, that we just trained. Um, so for this web app, uh, I nudge users to select um, the type of, of tone um, that they'd like to produce content um, for, and then they can specify uh, a writing task like um, uh, let's say, um, you know, I want to, to generate content about moving from San Francisco to Toronto. Uh, I'll click submit and then behind the scenes, that'll go ahead and, and call um, that specific generative model that we trained. Um, awesome. So in the interest of time here, uh, we can wrap things up and shift over to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so if folks have any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves. Uh, you can also ask questions directly uh, in the chat. I'll ask a question in the, in the meantime to kick us off here. Um, Ellie, could you explain a little bit about the other parameters that are available to users when uh, fine tuning a model? So like temperature and, and tokens and things like that. I know that's a factor in like what the model will end up outputting. Um, I think, yeah, learning a little bit more about how to think about that when fine tuning a model could be interesting. Yeah, definitely happy to, happy to speak to that. So I will say that you know, once you have this custom model, what's equally as important is making sure that you have the right prompt and the right sampling parameters to make sure that you're getting um, a high quality classif classification or generation consistently. Um, so when it comes to those hyper parameters for a generative task, like writing ad copy or um, paraphrasing text, writing a summary. Um, I always nudge users to ensure that they explore a bit with the temperature setting. Uh, you can think of temperature as the degree of randomness um, or degree of creativity uh, of the model. So when you have an extraction task, um, you might want to lower that degree of creativity or randomness. Uh, but when you're looking to you know, generate a blog post, um, you'll want to increase that temperature quite a bit. So once you have your fine tune deployed, uh, I, I would recommend that that folks check out the, the playground environment and Cohere. It makes it really easy to experiment with these different settings, adjust your prompt um, and see what will work best with, with the custom model that you've created. Awesome, sweet. Um, and I see we have a couple of questions here. So let me let me take this 
first one, one and a half questions. Um, and then I'll pass it back to you, Ellie. So first, uh, someone's asking uh, how, how you can become a data labeler for Surge. Um, you can reach out to us. Uh, our email is on the data set you'll get after this, um, after this webinar. Uh, definitely appreciate the interest. Um, uh, one of our key, one of the key things that we do on our platform is make sure that all the folks working on it and being la labeling data for us are super high quality, well educated, very fluent in the languages uh, they're working in. Um, so always, always appreciate and, and flattered by the interest, and feel free to reach out to us. Um, for the next question here, uh, it's how much training data should you have for a fine tune? Um, so that's a good question, and. I think it depends a little bit on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I do think that we've seen with Cohere models that you actually don't need a ton of data to, to get started with a fine tune. So sometimes even 10 to 100 examples uh, can be a, a, a really great starting place. If you want something more robust, that's why we were in the like thousand range. It allows you to get more diversity. So if you think about toxicity on Twitter, for example, one of the things that you want to make sure you have coverage over is all different forms of toxicity on Twitter. So again, there could be stuff that's sexist, there could be stuff that's racist, there's tons of categories of awful content online. And you wanna make sure you, not only you have coverage across all those categories, but within the categories, you sort of have coverage of the subcategories. Um, that can be hard to do sometimes with just 10 or 100 examples. So as you increase the size of your training data set, your model just become better and better around the edge cases and nuances, um, which can really have an outsized impact on your users, right? Um, any user that gets flagged for um, saying something that the system thinks is toxic, but they clearly think is not, uh, is not a good user experience. So it is good to go like a thousand and higher uh, for a fine tune as well, just to get as much like accuracy and coverage as possible, but also not a barrier to entry. You can get started with just a bit of data and see where that gets you. Um, I will pass it to Ellie in terms of this next question on, uh, prompting versus fine tuning and, and how you think about, um, the gains from each of those. Yeah. So one of the benefits that people often don't think of, uh, when it comes to fine tuning versus having, um, a, a very robust prompt with a baseline model is actually speed ups. Um, so because the fine tune model. Um, is already conditioned to generate content that um, or produce a classification that aligns with your quality expectations, you'll generally see that you don't need as lengthy of a prompt in terms of descriptions and potentially um, a few examples. Um, and so because of this, your fine-tuned model um, will likely require uh, a more brief prompt, which will able which will empower you to get a quicker, quicker response um, from, from the endpoint, which can be really helpful if you're, say, building a conversational AI um, tool and you, you need a response uh, in real time. Ellie, do you also want to take this question of what, which base model you used for the toxicity classifier? Yes. So I used our medium model. Um, so today on the Cohere platform, our medium embedding model uh, powers our classification, representation, fine tunes, uh, and then our medium generation model um, powers those generative fine tunes. And in the future, you'll see that the platform will start to support uh, fine tuning of our, our larger models. Awesome. And I see that Nick has raised their hand. Nick, do you, do you want to unmute and ask a question here? Yeah. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I've got you. Hey, how's it going? Um, good. Uh, thank you for the presentation. This was really, really amazing and really relevant for, to a project I'm working on right now. You mentioned um, class uh, conversational. If you're building a conversational AI tool, I'm wondering how you might do a fine tune, like how you might be able to like, it seems like each row of the data is only like one one response to one question or whatever, or one response to one prompt. Um, how would you be able to have a AI tool 
recognize the context and can and like remember earlier parts of a, like how can you lead like have like a train of conversation that like remembers the uh prompt like the inputs from the past that yeah that's sense. a that's a great question um so that ultimately depends on on the data that you're using for fine tuning and one thing that i would recommend is that uh, you upload a data set that's reflective of multiple conversation turns. So say I have um, one statement from the user and then one statement from the conversational agent to accompany that. Uh, and then I'll build off of that response in a, a secondary example where I'll, I'll have that like initial, initial request, initial response, um, and then uh, another command from the human and you can start to build these samples where like the context of the dialogue is getting longer and longer mm. um, scott do you have any recommendations about how to to kick off a data labeling job specific to a conversational task with surge yeah, so surge does a lot of conversational ai labeling as well so we have actually tools in our um on our platform that allow you to call like a, an endpoint of a, maybe a chatbot assistant you have, um, and then label data based on that conversation. So you could have surgers on our platform, have a conversation with your beta bot or, or whatever state it's in, uh, and then label things like, you know, did the bot say something toxic or did it say something helpful to me? Did it lie to me? Um, and answer a question per turns so that you can get data on how your um, AI is how your conversational AI is behaving, how it's performing, um, and how you can improve it. So yeah, we have a range of of conversational AI tools um, that we'd be happy to 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 show another time, or, or you can reach out to us too to to learn more about them. Cool. And quick follow up: what, what is there like a cost barrier to to use Surge? Like the, like what does the pricing look like? Uh, so the pricing is usually like uh, bespoke on a project basis. My, my best recommendation for learning more about that would be to reach out to the email address uh, in the data set that you'll be sent after the webinar. It's, it's team at surgehq.ai. I'll actually put it um, in the chat for you, for everyone, one second. Um, we can get you connected with, with someone that can advise kind of in, in more detail depending on, on your specific use case. Thank you very I much. I also see a question uh, in the chat about cohere pricing. Uh, so creating a fine-tuned custom model is entirely free. We also have a free developer tier. So as long as you're not serving these model <clears throat> outputs in a production environment, uh, you don't need to, to pay. Um, and then once you do enter that production state, um, you'll, you'll pay for the number of, of requests um, that you're calling to each endpoint. Awesome. So we have a few more minutes here. If there are other questions, happy to take them. I think one of the things also we want to highlight is we gave you two examples of, of use cases that you could use to, uh, fine tune a model with, but the options are really, uh, you know, human creativity is sort of the barrier here. So anything you want to accomplish uh, or a wide range of things you want to accomplish is possible with fine tuning large language models. They're really capable, capable of a wide variety of tasks, especially when you sort of point them in the right direction with this fine tuning process. And I know Cohere spends a lot of time making sure those base models are as strong as possible. Um, that's a great starting place, but then always like going that extra step of fine tuning for your specific use case. Think about like the nuances of, of your company, um, your users and what they're expecting from your products, right? You can fine tune it for that very specific use case so that when users go on your site and, and interact with some model that you're deploying, um, it feels, it feels natural and intuitive to them and not like, um, not like you're trying to stick something <clears throat> that's not quite relevant into the mix. So fine tuning is a really great way to make the customers feel like more comfortable um, with your product on your platform, kind of keep them uh, engaged. Uh, I see a couple other questions here. So let's see if we can get to a couple more before we are out of time here. 
Yeah. So as for the question relating to uh, conversational AI data sets that exist, um, I've found that there are some some helpful data sets uh, that are open source and exist publicly. Uh, but I what I would have um, or what I've found is um, has been really helpful is leveraging surge to actually clean some of those those data sets um, or make them like a bit more uh, specific um, to the task that I have. So yeah, I just wanted to call out that you don't necessarily only need to leverage surge when you're taking a data set from zero to one. You can also leverage the platform to improve the quality of, of a data set that you come across online. And let me also drop this link for you all. We have uh, Search has a bunch of free data sets that you are welcome to use um, in any way you see fit. I'm just going to link that to you all here. Um, you can check these out after this webinar. There's a whole bunch of different data sets on toxicity and sentiment analysis and search evaluation, um, financial transaction data. It's all free. It's on our it's on our platform. It's in that same results viewer that we showed you earlier. So feel free to browse through those. Um, you could use that. That could be a great starting point for fine tuning a cohere model if that sort of matches up roughly with one of your use cases. Or you could take that data set and uh, add on it, uh, embellish it, um, make it more specific to you. So that's also a good resource for you all to know about is uh, the free free data sets from Surge. So I encourage you to to check those out. Um, Ellie, do you want to grab maybe one more question here if, yeah, if possible, yeah, I, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Sounds great. I do see a question about leveraging different types of models in a singular application. This is definitely something that you can do. Um, I've spoken to quite a few users who have chained, um, our endpoints together. So you could, for example, um, uh, run a classification task with our classify endpoint. If that classification meets X criteria is X label, then you could trigger a call to our generate endpoint um, to accomplish some other type of, of task. So that's, that's definitely something that the Cohere API supports. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think we're right at time. So just to wrap this up, uh, we want to thank you a ton for joining us today, giving us 45 minutes. I hope we made it worth your time and you learned something about actually how easy it is to go fine tune a model from scratch uh, by using both Surge and Cohere. Um, we're we're going to send you a, an email after this uh, with a link to a survey and the data set uh, that we mentioned, the toxicity data set that I showed earlier. Um, if you don't mind filling out the survey, it'd be super helpful. We're going to do more of these webinars together in the future, and we just want to make them as helpful to you all as possible. So any feedback or suggestions you have on what you would want to see in the future, uh, we're all ears. Um, we appreciate the feedback. And more than that, we just appreciate your time. We're glad you were here. Um, it's a super exciting time to be in the large language model space, to be thinking about deploying them in products. So we'll definitely be doing more. Uh, of this type of webinar to, to help everyone understand how easy this is and how impactful and powerful it can be for your business. Uh, Ellie, any, any last words from you before we wrap this up? Nothing else from me. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, yeah, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll drop my email uh, in the chat. Uh, Cohere also has a, a Discord community. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out there with questions too. Awesome. I will drop my LinkedIn too. Uh, feel free to connect and, and DM me there if you have any questions. And we look forward to seeing you guys next time and hope you have a great day in the meantime. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.